Hey, kia ora. Helen Brahms here. Come to you live from Surprise in Arizona. Hope you're having a super fantastic sparkling day. Welcome to Before the Dirt Net podcast number 1454, day two of the um, International Genealogical Historical Research course. Man, I got that out. Yes, IGHR. Um, it's been a really cool day. I have learned, uh, again, my brain is fried. Um, we started today off learning about transcribing an abstract um, and even in transcribing was looking at the handwriting and how you can tell from the handwriting around the era that the pieces were written um, and we're talking the handwriting that takes you back. Um, we were showing um, there's different books out there about how to transcribe the handwriting but specifically looking for certain words or ways things are, are written like um, in one era, there was a place where if it was a double S name, if it, if it was a word with, that had two S's in it next to each other, the small, the first one would be the small one, but the second one would look like a small F written in cursive. Um, and so it was, it would confuse people when they came to transcribing that, but you have to, but this is some of the stuff that we were learning so that we knew to be on the lookout for it. And on some words, it had a little symbol beforehand that made it look like something else. So talking about, you know, transcriptions and that sort of thing. And then we had a brief conversation about, um, about AI um, being able to transcribe some of the things. And there are some programs in Europe that they're working on with the software and everything and the AI where they're doing pretty well with the um, with the transcriptions of the old hand of the old style handwriting, the different styles and stuff. Um, it'll be a while before it's perfected and it's out this way, but um, it it is going to happen. And I'm sort of like, yeah, but I still like to sit. I love to try and figure out what half these words are, and um, nothing more than what if it's in another language. <laughs> That is the, I mean, that is the coolest thing. It takes a, it takes me a minute to get into the groove, but once I'm in the groove, and I. And even if it's in another language, like for one family, I was looking at records in Mexico, which of course are all written in Spanish. And I was like, okay, there's got to be a way. And so what I did is I would handwrite out the transcript. I would look at what was on the screen, handwrite it out as best as I could transcribe it. And then I would take what I had written, put it into Google Translator and let it translate for me. And it did a pretty good job. Now, there were some words where I couldn't read, so I was taking guesswork. But thankfully, FamilySearch.org had a great um, a great um, document that you could use that would show you um, some of the more common phrases that you would be, that you come across, like months, days, um, area. You know, some of the names of some of the towns, the counties, that sort of thing, the regions, um, and then your know, mother, father, grandmother, grandfather, brother, sister, daughter son you know those sorts of words as well some of the words that would be more co excuse me more commonly known for genealogy terms that you would need to find but i had so much fun going through and transcribing that stuff and it was and the pamphlet they had was for spanish spanish not um latin american spanish um and so there was there were some differences between the words but it gave me enough that i was able to go in and get the translations for stuff and it got to the point and these transcription, these pieces of pa these pages were in books, so you're reading like whole paragraphs of stuff. And I did a whole translation on one of the birth records one time, and it was talking about it had the year, it had the year spelt out there, it had the name of the town in there. Um, then it talked about um, that these witnesses had come forward and were um, witness to the birth of, and then it had the name of the child who was the whose parents are, and father's name is this, mother's name is this, and they would hyphenate the last name. And I thought, that's interesting, because one would be the father's name hyphen with the mother's name. I'm like, well, that's interesting. And the mother would retain her name, um, retain her, her last name, instead of like in most cases um, where the mother would change the name to her husband's name. That didn't happen. And I was like, well, this is interesting. So once I got used to those common to those um what I was looking for and and how it worked, it made it, it made it actually made it easier to go through and just look for those particular terms in the different things. Um, there were a couple I came across where the birth was being registered with the parish, but they were reporting a stillborn, a stillbirth. So those ones were a little tough to read. 
but the, I, I worked it out for the marriage stuff. I worked it out for the death notices. Um, so yes, yeah, so we were talking about transcriptions and things and that was, that was kind of fun. Um, <coughs> and she, and they showed examples and stuff so we could see and even got homework to do for that one as well. <laughs> and then about um, when you've got the transcriptions about doing abstracts from it, which is just a small portion of it with some key details in there. So we got to learn about that as well. Um, <coughs> we also, um, another class we had today, which was really cool, was um, finding records you didn't know existed. Now, I know there's been a couple of episodes I have done on different places that you could look for records and some of those and some of those were mentioned today um but then there were other things that you could look at as well and I was sort of like oh this is interesting so I did learn some new places I could go look for the genealogy genealogical information um but most of the stuff that I had that I've talked about on past episodes um was what we were learning today so that was pretty cool but um, there were things like, you know, patent, patent records. I never thought of that. And I thought, oh, yeah, that, that that would be a good one to, you know, if you had somebody who was an inventor in the family and that sort of thing. Um, still in motion pictures. That was another one. I was sort of like, huh, yeah, that works. <laughs> you know, just, just things that, you, that, you, that you're involved with in some way every day, like motion pictures and TV, and, you know, still in motion pictures. You watch them all the time. You, you never think of. There's got to be a registry somewhere of these actors and their bios and things. I mean, even if you go to IMDb, they've got bios in there about some of the actors and stuff. Do you take it as gospel? No, you always have to back up and because you don't know who provided that information. So you always have to go and verify the information that's been given. Were they really born on that day? Did they change the date of their birth um, for whatever reasons and stuff like that? Um most of these other ones we had on there. So it was interesting going through that, some of the places you could go to to look for this information. And so we're, we're flying all over the internet today. It was, it was a lot of fun. And, <laughs> and then we had, um, we had our most technically challenged portion of the day, um, but it worked out very well. It, it was a lot of fun. And we had like, we had two sessions on about, um, about panning for gold and government documents and um you know i grew up i grew up in a library with the jewish with the jewish decimal system numbering system for the non-fiction part of the library um and then when i went into the air force and i was a librarian in the air force and i was working in the recreation library which is like your public library i didn't have any problems quickly moving across there because i knew the jewish the jewish decimal system hey <laughs> Oh my gosh, I wish you could see this. So <laughs> I don't even have my phone in there to take a picture of it. Um, I'll show you in a moment. Um, but then in our publications library, we had a completely different numbering system and all the books for the Air Force started with AF, Navy was N, Army was A, and then you had the defense manuals, which were DMs. Um, and so, and then they had the, the numbering system. That's so we had to learn that numbering system. Well, Congress, the Library of Congress also has their numbering system. And then there was the, um, oh, heck, what was that area called? Um, the Superintendent of Documents. They have their numbering system too, which was kind of interesting. So got to learn that there's a lot of different numbering systems out there based on the, um, the type of records that they are and who is responsible for filing them, archiving them, numbering them, and all of that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, we learned a lot about um, different areas and things. And um, and so we did, like, the theory, and then we had a break, and then we came back, and the second part of the lecture was hands-on. And um, due to technical difficulties, we managed to get through it. Um, we did lose the presenter at one point. I think that was in the first part. Um, but then he came back, and um, he's trying to, tell us which sites to go to says look I'm just going to get online here and just share my screen and we're just going to go to the site so we just started doing that <laughs> but it was it was very interesting in finding the documentation and things and like we went to one one resource that I had never been to before and 
for some reason, probably because it's fresh in my mind, because last night I was looking through, I was looking through a box of materials and stuff, which turned out to be some stuff from my mother-in-law's place to do with the genealogy of the, fa of the families. And she's done, she did a lot of research back in the 60s, 70s and 80s um, before there was even computers. So she did a lot of on the, you know, boots on the ground research, going to different um, repositories and stuff to get the information that she got, writing a lot of letters and waiting for information to come back. Um, but one of the, but, you know, after we've been that yesterday we were doing, was it yesterday? I don't remember what it was yesterday. Oh, I think it was more what we're talking about today. And, um, but what was really cool is that one of the items I came across, I was like, wow, this is really cool. And now you're going to get to see it because it's sitting in here. I've got a milk crate here and it's sitting across the corner of the milk crate. And Zephy just hid her chew stick in there. Which is, so she's going to. See if she gets up here now um but the see chew stick she just put that in there just now so i'm going to take this out because i need to it's okay i'm looking she's looking at face she's like what are you doing with this it's okay mommy's looking after it but one of the things i found in this in this box that i was in last night was um and i didn't even know i had it but this is an illustrated historical atlas of the state of indiana published by baskins fosters and co and I was like, what the heck? And so I opened it up. So, okay, Zephy, I'm going to put it back. <laughs> She's looking for a stick now. And then it's got maps of Indiana County in 1876. Now, my mother-in-law's father's family, when they came over from Germany, they settled in Wells County, Indiana. And so um, I'm trying to figure out how to do this. Yeah. So together with the with the plat of the Indianapolis and the sampling of illustrations, reprinted from an illustrated historical atlas of the state of Indiana, and it was this was the Indiana Historical Society in 1968. But this is information from 1876, which is a time period when they were there. And like, what the heck? And so starting with the letter A, now we're going to go down all the way to W. But they had here, like this is Cass County. Here's the map of Cass County and how it's split up into the different townships. I don't know if you can see all of that. I'm trying not to. Okay, so there's, oh, where am I? Yeah, there's the county of Cass. And so these are all the different townships within Cass County. Oh, this is so cool. And I know right in the center of it, where's the center page? This says pl plan of Indianapolis. So this is from 1876. This is the plan of, of Indianapolis. Isn't that cool? I love maps. I absolutely love maps. I love looking at the different types that they are, the different things and everything else. And that says the plan of Indianapolis by S.W. Durant, Durant, civil engineer, St. Charles, Illinois. Yeah. So that was the plan of Indianapolis. Interesting to see, but um, let's go back all the way to the back of the book here. UVW. Oh, another W to go. Right, Wayne County. There it is. So this is Wells County, Indiana, which is where all my mother-in-law's family settled when they arrived in the U.S., and they settled up here in Rock in the Rock Creek area up here. But this is the coolest thing. And it's got and it's got all the little plots and land thingies. And I even learned in um oh which class was I in? It wasn't last year, it was when I did this year. We learned oh no, it was last year. We learned how to read these maps and to find out exactly where the plot of land was that families had. That they would have um they would say, you know. Oh, I've got to remember all of this now. There's a formula. It tells you this, the north-south line, the east-west line, but then it also gives you, like, the number, and, like, this one here says 33, 35. But then it would turn around, and, and each one is into 4 or 16. I can't remember. I have to go back and have a look at my notes from last year. But there's a way that you can do it by the by the information that's on the map of the plot of land that they have and it gives the description of where it is and using these lines and these quadrants you can actually go in there and figure out exactly where they were 
So I thought that was pretty cool. And I got that, and Zephy just stuck her stick in it. So now I'm going to put that back there. Give her back her true stick. There you go. She doesn't know what to do with it now. So that was one of my cool finds from last night. And um, it kind of tied in a little bit with some of the stuff that we were doing today. But, you know, get going through. And so something maybe when I was on one of the sites to go in and type in um, one of the last names that I, that I research, and it came up with these different people. I'm like, I have no clue who these people are. So now I'm sort of like, well, now they fit into the family. And um, so now I'm going to go and look because they spelt their name the same way my mother-in-law spelt her name. And I know that there's like about 20 different variations of her last name, of her maiden name that has been spelt in different ways. Because I know that when I go looking for it, I have to, um, there's a little box that you can do for sound X. You know, it sounds like, this is how it was spelled, but it sounds like this. And then it goes and looks for different variations of the spelling as well. And if I want to go look by the variations, I have a list of about 20. I think it is, yeah, about 20 of them that's all spelled differently. But this one I typed in how she spelled it and up came these names. And I've got like, I have no clue who these people are. <laughs> so <laughs> that's going to go onto a list um, to be investigated at a later date and time. Um, yes, it's a very long list. <laughs> So the only problem with this is that you find new things, you're like, oh, let me go check this. And because most of the stuff that we're concentrating on is US, um, I'm able to, um, I'm looking at my husband's family since they were based here in the US. Um, and with the time frame, depending on what time frame it is, as to which part of the family I'm looking at, because I know my husband's father's family didn't arrive till the early 1900s here in the States, um, like 1902 or four or six or somewhere around. It was in the first decade of, of the 20th of the 20th century um and so um so when we're not looking at records for that era if we're looking at eras records from that era forward then I can go and look at that name if they're looking at um at records prior to that I've got to go to my mother-in-law's side of the family because they've been in the states longer um than my husband's side of the family my father's side of the family had been and so I was, um because they arrived like early 1800s yeah, because her grandfather was born in like 1835 and they were already in Wells County, Indiana at that point. Um, but his father, her great-grandfather was born in, in Germany and that's when they then came over after that. Um, so, you know, it's interesting looking at different things in land. Oh, we've got local land records analysis, correlation and interpretation tomorrow. Oh, cool. I'm going to keep that one handy. Yeah, maybe they'll remind me on how I'm supposed to do the little quadrant thingy, my Bob. And then I can find the exact plot of land that they had. Because um, I have that written down somewhere in my records of the family and my family notes. I have that stuff written down. In fact, I think I may even have a plot, of, a map of the plot of the land. I just got to figure out which box it's in. Um, I have several boxes with stuff from um, Brad's side of the family. Um, but anyway, so, you know, it's been it's been interesting and looking at these different places and going, oh, didn't realize this. was. You can actually go and look up the notes from Congress meetings and things. Uh, it was like, wait, what? There was Congress records that we could go look at. There's, um, you know, the Senate, the House, um, all of this sort of stuff that you can go and look up um, on, online. You can go look up um, different decisions that were made. Um, yeah, different decisions at the main things they talked about, debates that they had, um, things that didn't get passed, things that did get passed. And you get to see all of the stuff on that, um, journals of it. There's pages and pages and pages. And there's volumes of it, volumes, volumes and volumes. You can do it by the Congress number. Um, like we were looking up Congress, the 61st Congress today. Um, on what we're we looking at. I don't remember because I couldn't find it. <laughs> I kept coming to this dead end and trying to follow what they were doing, and I kept coming to a dead end. I'll figure it out, though. I've got until tomorrow night at 10 p.m. Central Time to get it figured out. So, um, yes, because that's when we have to submit the homework by. Um, so I have and so for um, them to go over on Thursday. And uh, so, yes, I've got until then to figure that one out. But, you know, we've got homework to do every night. Um, we've got one project that's going the whole week. We're not allowed to discuss it with anybody. When It's just going to be our own work. Um, we can't collaborate with anybody in the group or talk to anybody about it in the group. Or um, If we ask questions, they have to be general questions. They can't be specific questions. 
<laughs> so it's kind of, it's kind of a fun project we're working on and uh yeah and then we've got homework every day from instructors that we have throughout the day so we've got one project going the whole week which is due on friday morning before we start and then we have eating homework we have homework to be done each evening that gets evaluated although we got assigned two homework assignments today one we're reviewing tomorrow morning and one is reviewing on friday so um it's kind of, it's, I tell you, it's a lot of fun and there's so much stuff to learn. And like I found this whole other league of the family, now I've got to figure out how they fit in with my husband's mother's side of the family um, to see what's going on there. Um, but there's still some books I'm trying to track down as well. So um, that's kind of interesting as well. But anyway, that's it from us. It's an exciting day. So right now, let's see, I'm going to get some homework done and hope that it cools down. I still haven't had rain. They said we had a 51% chance at 11 p.m. last night. I don't know if it rained last night or not. Then they said we had a 51% chance of thunderstorms coming through at 1 p.m. today, and I was like, yay, it was sunny. Blue skies and sunshine. It's like, Aaron. <laughs> Which was just as well since I was sitting here in class. But there has been times when the clouds have come over and it's gotten really, really dark, and I'm just like, oh, maybe we need to put the light on. You wait five minutes and the clouds move on and you're back in sunshine again. So no needs for lights. So that's it from us for today. Um, another great day of learning, another day grab having your, your, your head spinning a little bit. Tomorrow we're going to be doing um, looking at legal foundations of genealogy, rural, rural research strategies, research, research strategies for female ancestors, which I'm looking forward to, local land records, analysis, correlation, and interpretation. So tomorrow's going to be another busy day. But what I like about it is... Um, you know, we have the reviews like 30 minutes in the morning. Then we have an hour and 15 of class, a 30 minute break, an hour and 15 of class, a 90 minute break for lunch, an hour and 15 for class, 30 minute break, an hour and 15 for class. And then, then we're done for the day, except for the evening stuff. So, um, and the evening stuff goes from 4.30 to 5.30. So, and they've got different topics. Tonight was open networking and they had um, breakout rooms, with different topics and stuff that you could go in and network with. Tomorrow night we learn about, um, one of the genial what's the one tomorrow night um the international commission for the accredit accredi accreditation of professional genealogists so we get to learn all about that tomorrow night and thursday night we have the closing ceremony celebration thing and all that sort of stuff so they have some i would say they have some really cool keynote speakers that come to those things we um and they talk about and the people that they have come in and present talk about um a research project that they did a, a the, their hypothesis their question that they had and how they went about solving it and the and what interesting things they found along the way and i think it was last year there was a guy who was talking about um this trick across the us in the wagon train and how um one family got left behind and how and how it came about that they got left behind and but he was telling us how to how to create a story using other people's stories and it was sort of like okay well this guy that that, that he was researching didn't leave and he didn't do any journaling about his trip or his his wagon trail journey um what other people were on that same thing so he found so through research he found other people that were on that same trail with him um and read through journal uh, read through journals of these other people to look for this guy's name not only did he find names in journals he found names in newspaper articles newsletters he found a whole wealth of information about this person who didn't even write a lick a, a, a letter about anything that he was doing on the trail um and so we learned about his journey on the trail through other people's stories and what they were experiencing while on the trail um so it was, that was really interesting about how to use other people's stories to tell your ancestors stories and it's just looking for like who was he traveling with at the, who were they traveling with at the time what direction were they going what what wagon train were they involved with and is there anybody else that was on that wagon train who maybe kept a journal and maybe your ancestor appeared in that journal um so you got to see life through other people's eyes about what your ancestors may have gone through if your ancestors hadn't left anything for you to follow so it kind of gives a good it's a good reason to keep a journal and i'm not very i'm not consistent with journal writing i am not consistent at all 
but it brings to light the importance of telling your story and recalling different historical events that occurred and what your reactions were. Were you there? Were you not there? Um, you know, for those that are that can remember this, um, you know, what was it like to watch the the moon landing? Um, where were you? You know, where were you when when the moon when they landed on the moon? What were you doing? Did you watch it? Um, you know, um, you know, nine eleven being the more recent one, but um, you know, different stories that have been passed down through generations. You know, what historical events took place that some of your ancestors took place in, and they wrote about it and left the story behind for you, so you could see what it was like um, if they were in a protest, or what was it like if they were working in the office that did X, Y, Z. Um, and, you know, that happened. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of interesting stories out there. And this is why people need to tell their story. And I know I'm not the best at doing my journaling. I know that. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. And sometimes when I sit down to write, I think of, oh, let me tell that. And I'll get sidetracked and go off and tell some story from my past um, about an event, you know, um, I was telling who we were talking to the other day. Oh, we're talking about um, the coronation. I think we're talking about King Charles coronation, and uh, you know it was really weird because I had only I've only ever known Queen Elizabeth II to be the Queen of England and the Commonwealth, and you know she's always been that that figurehead for the for the countries and stuff, and you know suddenly she wasn't there, and now we have to have King Charles, and it's sort of like oh um, yeah. But I did journal about my experience at the coronation. You know, I was sitting there watching it. I had my nightshirt on. I had my tiara on. And I did journal um, my thoughts about it as it was happening. So um, in time, people go back. And I, I even had my parents on the on a Zoom one time and asked them about what they remember about the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. Um, well, they didn't get to see the coronation. They were sitting at the, they were both, you know, sitting at the radio listening to what was going on. Um, and they mum doesn't even recall um hearing the news about um king george the sixth queen elizabeth's father passing and her becoming queen she remembers her becoming the queen she remembers a little bit about the coronation about just hearing it on the radio um and i said you want to know an interesting fact about the queen's coronation and she said what's that and i said oh she was coronated on june 2nd 1953 she goes yeah and i said on may it was either may 30th or may 31st um, Edmund Hillary and, um, oh, what was that Sherpa's name? Tenzing Norgay. Tenzing, oh, why can I never remember his name? But they conquered Everest and the word was sent through, but they did not tell the Queen about it until the morning of her coronation, as it was going to be a coronation gift to her. Um, so she got to hear about it a few days later before the news broke. And they kept it from the the media and everything until the and then we said told the queen and of course the news broke about it and that sort of stuff so um yeah so you know there's different history things that i go back and ask my prince what do you remember about this happening what do you remember about that happening see i can i can i will tell you this i have seen the royal weddings for um princess anne to captain mark phillips um prince charles to diane lady diana spencer um followed by um prince Andrew to Sarah Ferguson, followed by um, Prince Edward to Sophie. Um, I should have never remember her, her last name. Then I watched, um, then of course I, was, I heard about all the births of all the grandchildren. Um, and then now watching them all get married. And I said, you know, the first time I missed a royal, watching a royal wedding live was when um, uh, one of Prince Andrew's daughters got married and they had the big procession and everything else. I said, I didn't, that's the first one I missed, the first royal wedding I've missed since seeing Princess Anne get married back in 1970, it's like 77 or 78, somewhere around there. Um, you know, I'd watched all the royal weddings up to that point. Um, I'd even watched King Charles getting remarried to Camilla at the time as well. So I watched that wedding as well. Um, but, you know, just talking about that and the royal funerals, like I saw Princess Diana's we uh, funeral, I saw the Queen Mother's funeral, um, I don't think they televised Princess Margaret's one, though. I don't recall seeing that one. Um, but I recall seeing the Queen Mother's, Princess Diana's, um, Queen Elizabeth's. 
Prince Phillips. Yeah, those are the only ones that have taken place. So, you know, what were my thoughts on those? What did I think about them? And yeah, you know, I just love the pageantry. Um, yes, I like the royal family, um, but I love the pageantry that they have and the traditions and um yeah, just the the pomp and circumstance. It really is. It's it's just a really cool thing just to watch and to say, I watched that. Um, yeah, and then, of course, the coronation of King Charles. Will I see another coronation in my lifetime? Maybe. I don't know. It depends if I live out, if I outlive King Charles or he outlives me. We don't know when our time is up. So I may get to see another coronation in my lifetime. Um, but, yeah, that was, that was, that was kind of, that was a really cool experience to watch that, having never seen one before. Um, but, yeah. Anyway, I'm out of here. I got a DOG for WALK in about an hour when it gets a little, when it gets down from 114 degrees to maybe 111. <laughs> That's what it's been the last couple of nights we've been out for a walk. And base, and our walks have not been very long because of the heat. It is just, it's just, it's just too damn hot to walk. <laughs> Although the mornings, because I have to be online by, um, by 7.15 in the mornings, We've been going earlier in the mornings, so it's been high 80s, maybe. In, today was 89 when we went for a walk. That's the coolest morning we've had for a long time. So 89 this morning at 6 o'clock. So, yeah, we're getting out earlier for those. But anyway, I'm out of here. Go have a super fantastic sparkling evening, and we'll catch you guys back here tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Pacific. Hey, Conera.